Hey guys, I'm trying out a new show here where I get different perspectives on an issue. So let me know what you think with your comments and likes. Discussion on tariffs, one of those things that generally gets Americans about as riled up as the Fed raising their interest rates from 1.25% to 1.5%. Which just throwing a little Trump and oh man does everyone make it seem like the apocalypse is coming. So today we're going to be looking at how this steel tariff is being reported from a few different sources. But before we look at the speculation, let's just talk about what's actually happening. During a meeting with Benjamin Netanyahu, marking one of the fleeting moments Trump wasn't the most corrupt politician in the White House, Trump panicked Republicans by saying, No, we're not backing down. Uh, Mexico is, uh, we've had a very bad deal with Mexico. Very bad deal with Canada, it's called NAFTA. Oh man, poor Netanyahu. I've been that guy when my friend's at a bar with me and starts spouting out all sorts of things that I know is offending everyone around us. It's a really bad sign when you're sitting there thinking, let's talk about something a little less polarizing. Say, moving Israel's capital to Jerusalem. So what is this trade war we're not backing down from? Well, Donald Trump has said that he won't back down from putting in tariffs of 25% for steel and 10% for aluminum. And the media believes he'll do this because, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And if you're still fooling me, chances are I'm trying to educate the public. So let's get into it and see what people are saying. We're starting with Fox News. I think this is Trump's way of starting to renegotiate some of these deals. Um, you know, you heard Wilbur Ross talk about the automobile t tariffs. In Europe, they tax our cars at 10%. We tax theirs at 25 I don't know anybody that would say that's free or fair trade. I think Ronald Reagan once said that free trade is only free if it's fair. Most people think that Donald Trump is using these tariffs as leverage to renegotiate the NAFTA, or North American Free Trade Agreement, which is kind of like threatening to shoot someone if they don't loosen gun bans. Not to discount this strategy though, because most of our steel imports do come from Canada. So this could be a very obvious strategy to bring them to the table and get them to agree to more fair free trade deals. He went on. It's not a huge number, as he said, it's $9 billion worth of tax on steel. But I think this is the opening foray, and I think what the markets are worried about more than anything is that it gets out of control, and I'm not sure it's going to get there. In this case, he's referring to a massive drop in the stock market that happened as soon as Trump announced his tariff plan. Generally, when the market drops as soon as you announce something, it's about as good a sign as your poker opponent jumping for joy when he looks at his hand. In this case, though, Fox Business is speculating that this drop is happening not because of the policy, but because of the potential backlash to the policy. Which makes sense. I mean, if we increase tariffs on everyone and they do nothing back, well then, yeah buddy. But when you arbitrarily raise prices on people, they tend to react. Now he kept going. Um, you know, there's a secondary piece to this in particular and why I think he chose steel is that, you know, he's pushing an infrastructure plan and, you know, that, that's a major $500 billion to a trillion dollars, somewhere in that neighborhood, that's a public-private partnership. And I think he thinks that that would be a terrific way for, as a part of that plan, for the U.S. steel manufacturers to participate. Well, that's not the stated reason he chose steel, but we'll get to that later. Now, this is an interesting argument that I watched a few times. The U.S. alone doesn't produce enough steel to sustain everything, so this will inevitably raise the price of steel. And if what he's saying is true, then the government is doing this because they're going to be buying more steel for infrastructure projects. One could say it would be like repealing Obamacare before you shoot yourself in the foot to help insurance companies. That said, I think the point he's getting at is that since we need to buy so much steel, we should be buying it domestically and creating more American jobs in the process, despite those increases in price. Now, one super interesting point that was raised in a different show. I think what the president was saying was that because we have a big deficit and the other sides have big gains from trade, they have much more to lose in a trade war than we do. That's interesting. Because we're at a trade deficit with so many countries, does that give us a certain amount of leverage? 
Basically, if a country sells us more material than we sell to them, then any increase in tariff we impose on them would hurt them a lot more than any tariff they impose on us. In theory, that would be like owing a credit card a lot of money and demanding they give you more money or else you won't pay for what you've already borrowed. Except, in this case, you have more guns than an NRA meeting in the world's most powerful military. Now, he went on to speculate, I don't think the retaliation is likely to be on steel as such. I think if it is on anything, it'll be some little product in a key state to try to get uh, Mitch McConnell or Paul Ryan feeling some pressure. All right, so targeted attacks on Paul Ryan and McConnell's districts to get them to flip? Sorry, foreigners, but even if our country had a negative employment rate, Paul Ryan forgot Dale Earnhardt's number was three. Translation for the liberals, that's the equivalent of saying Beyonce is just okay. And the cheese factory collapsed in his state of Wisconsin. That state is going red. So now let's check out what the liberals have to say. There's 200,000, so more or less, 200,000 steel and uh, iron workers in America um, and aluminum. There's five and a half million employed by businesses that use steel. Like the automakers and others. Auto, energy, infrastructure, from the beer cars, uh, planes, yeah. Diet Pepsi and Diet Coke. I don't want to give everyone free time, but that's, that's what you're getting. Yes, if you make steel more expensive, then the things you need to use steel to make also get more expensive. As if to illustrate this perfectly, just look at the ticker to his right. Oh no, US markets are down. Boy, what I would give to see some green on a chart right now. Oh wait, never fear, because steel and aluminum are up. He continued to say, Look, if it's $50 higher, if it's $100 higher, that can hurt. That can hurt a family budget. Mm -hmm. It could be more than that. Look, in theory, if you raise the tariff by 25%, the price can go up by 25%, okay? Yes, so look out everyone out there looking to buy bricks of steel, because that's the only thing that's going to go up by 25%. If the cost of your canned Coke goes up by 25%, then congratulations, you're buying an empty can. Usually there are other components in people's purchases that make up the vast majority of the cost. But this would still influence the price of steel-based products. Also, because foreign imports have to pay an additional 25% fee, American producers are going to just raise their price up that much and keep the rest as profit. We're already hanging by a toenail on NAFTA. If we have to walk out of NAFTA or those negotiations totally break down, then this steel thing turns in from a minor irritants to a major calamity for our economy and our stock market. Make no, make no doubt about that. Well, yeah, if the NAFTA negotiations break down, that would probably not be great for our economy. And again, nothing helps spur on free trade negotiations quite like the looming threat of unfree trade. And if NAFTA falls apart, it will be harder for the US to get access to cheap imports and large export markets. So this brings us to the that's all I have to say about that portion of the show, where I throw in my own two cents. First, why are we implementing the steel tariffs? Well, the official reason is it's a national security issue saying that steel is crucial to the national security of our nation, and if we go to war, we can't have another country being able to throttle our access to steel, which we used to make almost every war machine out there. Now, if you're nodding your head thinking, hmm, that sounds reasonable, just know that, according to the Washington Post, who we can all trust because they were just the star of an Oscar-nominated movie. According to defense industry officials, this might hurt the military in two ways. First, they agree with Trump that a lot of military equipment is made from steel, so raising the price on steel and lowering the supply is not really great for them. Secondly, they identify the fact that it's not like we're getting our steel from Iran or Saudi Arabia. We're getting our steel from our friendly neighbors to the north, Canada. And in a wartime situation, we could probably rely on them. But can we really trust this guy? That is a man seriously contemplating how reputation killing it would be to shake our president's hand. Instead, the US Department of Defense who support his plan, in theory, because oh no, his steel went up 25%? Well, let's just add another zero to this blank check. 
They do have some amendments they would like to propose though. Specifically, the DoD would like to see these tariffs targeted to certain countries, like China, who we are currently suing in an anti-dumping case and charging 75% tariffs on. China said it's not going to sit still if this uh, huge anti-dumping duty is placed on Chinese steel to the United States, more than 75% apparently. So would you think this is the start of the trade war already between China and the US during this administration? More on that story if you request it, but I pretty much just laid it out for you. The consensus seems to be that the Trump proposed steel tariffs are, in their current form, hurting the wrong people if the goal is to solve a national security threat. Instead, his selected targets would indicate he's going for more leverage in the NAFTA negotiations that are currently going on. So how can these tariffs become law? Well, because this is modern day America, I'm sure there's at least one congressional committee that has to be made and a government shutdown involved, right? Well, no, actually. Mr. Trump's move, wow, not calling him President Trump, bold move economist, falls under section 232 of the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, which allows the president to act without congressional restraints. He can do whatever he wants in this area, and while that might sound alarming to some, it does give him a lot of leverage at the negotiating table. Finally, before I sign off, hmm. I just wish I could think of a time in modern history when we used protectionist tariffs to defend our steel industry. Well, set your TV to full screen because we're going back to 2002 when Bush set up steel tariffs. Now enjoy listening to a man give Trump a run for his money in the competition for most inarticulate president. I decided that, uh, that uh, imports were severely affecting our industry, an important industry. Uh, in, a, in a negative impact and therefore provide temporary relief so that the industry could restructure itself. Uh, it's exactly what the World Trade Organization allows for. What happened as a result of that? Well, here's a hint. They were removed a year and a half later when they were scheduled to expire in four years. And not because of a mission accomplished. Luckily for us, in 2003, the US commissioned an international trade commission study to see what the effects of these tariffs were. And oh man did the word unintended consequences show up quite a few times in that report. The study found that amongst trade organizations that use raw materials, employment fell by 200,000 as a result of these tariffs. And to sum up the research in one sentence, it said, it finds that the costs of the safeguard measures outweighed their benefits in terms of aggregate GDP and employment, as well as having important redistributive impacts. Now, we've been conditioned to hear redistributive and think, eh, at least that part's good. But in this case, it was referring to distributing the cost of the tariff, which apparently got distributed to almost everyone, lowering consumption more than everyone thought. So there you have it, left, right, and center. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello, YouTube. I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of That's All I Have to Say About That, click here. And please click here to subscribe and remember to like below. And if you're really a fan, you can look up our Facebook group. That's all I have to say about that. And as always, thank you for watching.